Remember that cricket is a funny game. A hundred years before we protected our head, players looked after their groins. So don't be as stupid as old cricketers. Protect your computer now. NordVPN is the protection I use when facing cyber shortfalls or when rights issues try to dismiss me. Geoblock so you can watch all the cricket you want. Grab your NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 51 of the Footmarks podcast. I am your host, Peram Kazi, who you can find at Def Mango on Twitter. And with me, as always, is Jared Kimber, who you can find absolutely everywhere. And the title for this particular episode of Footmarks is Cloudy with a Chance of Sixes at the T20 World Cup. Shout out to Estelle Vasudevan. She's the one who came up with this particular title. And Jared, T20 cricket has evolved heaps over time. And scoring rates are currently hitting unprecedented peaks, right? As of now, the ongoing IPL is the fastest scoring franchise T20 tournament in history. And has the biggest average as well. Hmm. You've mentioned prior that you always thought that this will be the natural evolution of the sport and batting in general. And if anything, uh, you thought that it happened a bit later than you had imagined. Can you elaborate on that thought? Yeah, I think. I remember uh, me and Freddie Wilde having a look at um, some data. It must be around 2017, 2018. We were in a press box together. Um, you know, back in the days when Freddie still came to test matches and... Um, uh, and hung out with the press and and we were having a look at it and it was like both of us just thought that there was still a lot of conservatism in the way that batters went about stuff so, you know the most famous one of course is the the seventh uh, sixth over has got a huge uh, runs per over and the seventh over has a small runs per over and yet quite regularly you have set batters in that seventh over there is no reason to bat that way other than the fact that that is how batters are taught oh the field is right now so we need to start again it's like no you don't you're set. You need to keep hitting fours and sixes, right? You just need to find a different way of hitting them than you were a minute earlier. Um, you know, little things like that, conserving wickets, um, uh, not taking as many risks as they should have, uh, you know, all, all the way through. We, You know, we, I wasn't the only one. I think most analysts would agree. Um, Katakea was talking for years about, like Andre Russell was the obvious choice of how other batters are going to go about it in the future, right? And mm. and I suppose maybe someone like Fraser McGurk might be the first, one of the first sorts of those sorts of players coming through who who just believes every ball should be hit for four or six or it's a dot ball. Mm. And so with that, you look at the run rates, and you, you know you can see them in the article up on 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 the website on on goodareas.co or on the video wherever you go. It's pretty flat for a long time, mm. right? And then the last couple of years, hundred. T10 cricket, um, there's been, you know, even some stuff like baseball. I think batters have now worked out, wait a minute, we can score much quicker than we thought we could without um, losing our wickets. And then you add the other bit to that, Bayram, which is there should be a natural, we should be scoring quicker anyway. The, the there's, there's not much that bowlers can do about the fact that grounds aren't about to get any bigger. Right, yeah. bats aren't about to get any worse, and batters <laughs> now understand two things: how to physically set themselves up for hitting fours and sixes, and um, how to mentally change their mind. So you factor all that in. It's like, well, how would bowlers be be doing well? There would have to be an external pressure, like say the wobble ball, say the reinforced seam of the kookaburra. Those are things that sl slowed it down a little bit. But overall, it makes more sense to get quicker. Absolutely. And for everyone who wants to go check out the piece, you can go to goodareas.co, bookmark that website, and you can find all of our written content, videos, and podcasts over there. So that's definitely one to look out for. And uh, yeah, you mentioned the you know combined strike rates of all the major leagues. And when I say major leagues across the globe, I'm talking about the IPL, the Big Bash League, uh, the CPL, PSL, and the Blast in England. And over the years, if we look at the combined scoring rates, you know, the graph is fairly linear and the mm. scoring rate hasn't really grown astronomically. It's, it's fairly slow. But recently, you see that that linear graph has taken a turn upwards. And this is yeah. probably due to the combination of ultra-aggressive batters entering the scene, like you mentioned Fraser McGurk, because we're going to see more of those now. And current batters like Travis Head have changed their game accordingly and they're also playing like Fraser McGurk's, right? And you've got a great range of players. You've got bigger and better bats. And also, you know, the static dimensions of the playing field, as you mentioned. Mm. What element do you think has been the most significant, however, in this uh, change of approach from batters? Um, I, I think 
In the IPL specifically, it is the impact sub, I think is absolutely huge. Uh, you know, we've talked about the Evan Golbus effect of looking at batting lineup and realizing that you can bat to number eight. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Raman Deep was batting for number nine um, for Kolkata in some games, and you're like, Phew. you know, good, <laughs> good luck getting, uh, get, good luck getting eight wickets out to get to the tail um, in that sort of situation. So, so I do think there's an element of that, um, but but I, I think it's probably the fact that players now have played enough 100 and T10 and all those sorts of things and, and seen that, right? And, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's an accident that Baz Ball came off the back of mm -hmm. a revolution in, in one day cricket and T20 cricket. Yeah. So I think sometimes when you see the other format and you're like, well, wait a minute, we can score a lot of runs, you know, we can score at 15 runs and over. Um, and we don't, we're not going to get bowled out here. Um, and once team, once teams start to see that, I think that's the big change for them. And and a lot of it is mental because I the technological changes have been there for a while, like the batting, mm. uh, you know, uh, that sort of stuff's been there for a while. The range hitting's been there for a long time. But I do think the big thing that was always missing was that uh, belief that they could do that and that it was something worth doing. And clearly that has changed massively now. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's talk about each of those leagues individually uh, for a second. Let's take the blast first, right? In England, where batters almost always average between 24 and 26. And the strike rate is also pretty much always between 130 and 140, which does make this a fast scoring competition and a batter's league. And I mean, there are a few outliers over there where either the scoring rate was really poor or no one was getting out. <laughs> that said, 2023 was the fastest scoring blast in the history of the blast. That tells you something, doesn't it? Yeah, I think 2023 is the year you really start to notice it in the numbers where there's a few leagues. I think uh, Pakistan had a huge scoring 2023 as well. Yeah. Um, the IPL had a step up in 2023, um, I think maybe in the CPL. So it's clearly at that stage. And there was a bit of a regression before that because Kookaburra reinforced the ball. So people lost mm -hmm. wickets more at the top. And that's gone away now. So I think that is, I, I think that's very fair to say that is a big part of it. I, and what I found so interesting and you you know you pointed this out already most of these leagues have a real pattern to them mm -hmm. and the england one is a batting league and i think most people who would play um cricket would say that that's a batting league um and it's been known as a batting league and then there's like one year where you know what was it two years i think is it where there's rain and um and no one makes any runs in in those years uh, yeah. but other than that it's uh you know it, it it's always been a pretty good batting yeah, uh, league. And if you think about England international cricket, mm -hmm. what they've been doing with their white ball pitches over the last few years, it kind of makes sense. And and that's why that's how the whole river that's how we ended up with Basball, right? Which is yeah. Root and Stokes and Morgan and Butler and all these guys, even even Denley and Milan, the lower tier guys, Alex Hales mm -hmm. and Phil Salt, they've all been smashing the ball domestically. And that was sort of what unlocked English cricket from from where it was. So um yeah, no, I definitely think uh, I definitely think in, in that situation that there was um, uh, that it's a it, you could see the pattern really, really clearly. Yeah, I mean it checks out, you know, given the white hot rev rev uh, revolution that's happened in cricket, and now we see uh, limited overs cricket has changed forever. At least England have changed the way they play drastically, and and mm. they've stuck by it. And it's been a while now; it's not even like recent news. But you mentioned the PSL. I want to talk about it like from its inception, right? It started off as a bowler-friendly league, which doesn't yep. really come as a surprise because A, it was being held in the UAE where the surfaces were slow. And then Pakistan is renowned for his, both its fast bowlers and, well, historically spinners. Currently, they're experiencing a bit of a drought. Uh, but then, you know, after the first few seasons, which were all like bowling seasons, the PSL moves from the UAE to Pakistan and it completely transforms. Now it's a batting league, right? So much so that, as you mentioned in the 2023 edition, the combined strike rate of that tournament was 144, which at that time was the most in any league ever. And currently yeah. even, it's only behind this ongoing IPL, which really, you know, paints a picture. So it is a bit wild, isn't it? Given how Pakistan is supposed to like have a bowling league. That's what conventional wisdom tells you, but that's not the case anymore. I think it what works. this tells you really is that I think if you would have asked me or you seven, eight years ago, we would have said, well, yeah, Pakistan's a bowling league, but it's because they've got so many good bowlers, mm -hmm. right? And now we look at it and we go, Pakistan was probably a bowling league because um, the pitches. Mm -hmm. 
And that's really, really interesting because, you know, there's many conversations, you know, the BPL, which I didn't put in this. I, I did limit it to the, you know, the, the sort of the very major tournaments. Hmm. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the Blast is, uh, has a lot of cricket as well. So it's a little bit more even than some of the other hmm. tournaments. Um, so you, but you look at the, you look at the, um, the BPL and you're like, the pitches play probably the biggest um, part. And now we look at the PSL and we're like, now, clearly that is true it is the pitches that really dominate um and change what a league is and how many runs are going to be scored there and, and how things are going to go so i i, I found that really fascinating because i didn't i had a, an inkling that cpl was a bowling league and that psl was a bowling league and, and some of the others that we'll talk about but it's not until you put it all in front of you and you go oh wow yeah now i see the patterns right here yeah. and i didn't realize that psl had changed that much until mm. I looked at this. I, I knew that there was more runs being scored there, mm. but not like this. Oh, I, I definitely knew because I remember back in the day when it was being held in the UAE, you know, 140 odd would be defended mm. every now and then, right? And it was drastic when it came back to Pakistan, not just PSL, Test Cricket. Pakistan was a great Test team in the UAE, right? But when Test Cricket came back to Pakistan, they've only won a couple of series here and there. So... If you go and look at that scatter graph uh, in Jared's piece, you'll see how the recent PSL years are all like in one cluster and the UAE PSLs are all in a cluster down below. So it is a really interesting one and, and you can definitely put it entirely on the pitches, I would say. Uh, but let's move on to the Big Bash. Now, uh, we can identify very clearly that this is another bowler-friendly tournament, right? As not a single season in the history of the Big Bash League has seen a strike rate uh, shoot north of 135. Do you think one of the reasons why the 2022 edition of the T20 World Cup, which, which was held down under, was uh, the slowest T20 World Cup of all time because of uh, the B Big Bash League being a bowler friendly league? Or, you know, it's just because uh, there were certain uh, conditions at that time in Australia, you know, wet pitches and all of that. Uh, but also, if you look at the conventional 20 over cricket scoring rates in 2022, it didn't match at all. No, no, it's definitely an outlier. Look, I think I think three things happened. Hmm. Um, World Cups are usually low scoring. Hmm. Uh, it was early season in Australia, and you know, it, you know, especially in southern Australia, Tasmania and Geelong uh, were the two where it was like that's not summer for either of those two places. <laughs> um, and it rained a lot in some of the other places. It rained in Sydney and Brisbane, yes. I think, certainly in Sydney. Um, hmm. It was a lot of rain. So I think it was a combination of all of those things that, that came together. But you do then look at the big uh, I, the big bash data and you go, well, it's on the lower end, but it's within the margin of the big bash. Um, if, you, if you're thinking that the big bash is in the height of summer and this one is outside of summer. So, yeah, so I think it was a combination of all three, um, uh, which, I, yeah, again, I don't think the big bash is seen in the same way that the PSL was always seen, right? Yeah. PSL has always been seen as a bowler, bowler's league. Big Bash, I've never really heard anyone mention that before. But you look at this data and it'd be hard to argue that it's not dominated by bowlers. Yeah. Interesting. Do you think that um, the dimensions of the grounds in Australia also play a part in this? Because they're as big as they get, right? It's not easy to yep. clear the rope over there. Yeah, it's a weird one. Because, you know, uh, it's it's not easy to clear the rope. But it's probably the easiest grounds on earth to score two runs a ball. <laughs> Also fair. <laughs> you know, you watch yeah. you watch a game at the MCG or Perth Stadium or, you know, some of these bigger, you know, surfaces and you think, well, how the hell are they going to put in field? I remember, remember talking when I was with Melbourne Stars and I was just like, we should be encouraging our players to chip. Yeah. Because they will never go out and they can score at two runs a ball from pretty much over 10 through to over 16. And then, you know, at the end, they can start looking to clear the boundaries and and other teams will try and clear the boundaries and won't, won't be able to do that. So... Uh, th there is that, but you're right. I do think that again. I think the grounds play a bit of a part um, in that, but there are still smaller grounds. I don't think Bellary is particularly big, for instance, and Adelaide Oval has tiny square boundaries. That you know, um, uh, so uh, and and you know, there's no ground in the world that actually has pro their own proper dimensions anymore, right? They're all mm. so far in from the uh, from the fence. But but yeah, I, th I do think the grounds play a little pl part in that. Yeah, but it is surprising, actually. You know, when I was going through that data, I was like, okay, Australia, Big Bash League, Bowling League. It did, you know, astonish me a bit because it doesn't have that branding. It's not perceived like that. But as we mentioned, there are a bunch of reasons why that's the case. And yeah, a combination of that and the conditions at that time of the year in Australia, plus the rain, 
and the dimensions. A lot of things why, a lot of reasons behind that World Cup being low scoring. But anyway, let's go to the CPL. And this is important because we've got a World Cup coming up in the Caribbean, right? At least partially. And the CPL is a funny one because you look at West Indian batters. They're known for their six hitting prowess. They get employed by different franchise T20 teams across the world. They're globetrotters and they go and apply their trade in tournaments. And, you know, that's how they kind of play the circuit. We'll go hit some sixes there, hit some sixes here, this and that. The CPL, however, is one of the slowest scoring leagues in the world where bowlers basically dominate and the surfaces, they vary across the board uh, because we're looking at a cluster of different island nations over here in the Caribbean. Mm. But they are common in the sense that they usually slow batters down. Now, in 2023, they did have faster scoring pitches and the numbers are proof of that in the CPL. But yeah. given all of this information, what sort of T20 World Cup can we expect in the Caribbean leg uh, in a month's time? Yeah, it's a really good question. It, it's so dependent on the individual pitches. So you can have a, I think you can have a tournament in the West Indies. And I, I don't think there's another place really where this would happen in the world. Mm where depending on where you play, you might have a completely different kind of tournament than another team. Mm. Um, you know, it can vary that much, but, you know, between some of these wiggers, Barbados and Guyana are just not, they're not even related to each other. Um, St. Lucia and Guyana are not really related to each other either. You know, Trinidad's got its own vibe as well. So it is really, really different to everywhere else, you know, and then you get the fact that um, yeah, the World Cups are the slowest scoring tournaments. And that has been consistent all the way through. Um, I think the only, uh, well, the fastest scoring T20 World Cup has been 2007, which is yeah. bonkers, right? So, it's the inaugural one. <laughs> yeah. So if you think about that, you would assume that that means that this is going to be another really, really low scoring tournament. Having said that, there, is been, there has been a bit of a bo um, boost towards faster scoring in the CPL of recent times, same as some of the other leagues. So I suppose from, from that um uh that thinking uh you know you can certainly be in a situation where where you at least feel a little bit more what i must say confident but uh you know maybe it won't be as dour as some of the other um tournaments have been but you have to throw in the american side of things of which mm -hmm. i assume is going to be small grounds and flat pitches so you might then have an even more varied World Cup where maybe in America you get some kind of pitches and in the West Indies you get another kind of pitches. Mm. You know, uh, I can tell you one thing. The New York pitch is not going to be like the Guyana pitch. Yeah. I mean, anyone can definitely make that assessment because Guyana is one of the slowest surfaces in the world and they're mm. getting a drop-in pitch from Adelaide for the New York ground in, in Nassau or however you pronounce that. So uh, we can maybe perhaps even expect some bounce over there. But mm. does it intrigue you? Right, that the fastest scoring T20 World Cup was the inaugural edition in South Africa because that was back in 2007, and this is a time where you know T20 cricket was for the most part perceived as somewhat of a gimmick. It wasn't serious business. Maybe that's why it's the fastest scoring one, perhaps. There's an early year, and I took it off because the data is not a, 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 as big. And remember, those tournaments didn't have a lot of games hmm. um, compared to later on. I only left it in because you know we, I was. You know, a big part of the reason I did this piece was to show how different the IPL is than what the World Cups usually are. Yeah. Um, but specifically, I think if you, uh, there's an early year in T20 cricket, and I, I reckon it's 2009 or 2010 that's really high scoring. Mm -hmm. And it's it would be probably more like the last three years mm -hmm. than, than the era that it's in. So we have had situations like that before. Um, you know, South Africa, you have, um, uh, I, I can't remember where all the games were, but you quite often, you have the altitude. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of sixes scored. You know, it's you talk about Australia, it's kind of the opposite of Australia, right? And from that point of view, there's a lot of the grounds are up high. Um, they're not as big as the Australian grounds. Um, and, and the pitches are really rock hard. So the ball travels really, really quickly. You know, the yeah. record score we had in, in, in Joburg and the Wanderers all those years ago. Mm -hmm. So I do think there's an element of all of that that I've just said that I, I do think plays a part. Um, what's a better way of looking at it as well? Um, and because people didn't know how to play it, there was a lot more slogging, hmm. right? Whereas I think as teams got smarter, they actually got more conservative with the way that they played T20 cricket. Hmm. So 
now it's a combination of those two things. It's like you want the you want to be able to consistently score fast, but in a smart way. Because back then it was probably you score fast, right? Or you're 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 um quite consistent. And so I can understand why that 2007 season might be the biggest one based on everything we've just said. But even then, it's not like a high strike rate, is it? It's yeah. still under, is it under 130 still, I think? It's 124, which tells you a lot about World Cup cricket, doesn't it? And the pressures of international cricket, I suppose, yep. how when nation states are competing, there's a whole lot at stake. And all of these cup competitions in the ICC, people take them far more seriously. And then, of course, you're donning your nation's jersey, which for a lot of teams adds that extra layer of pressure as well. So it's I, a completely different beast. Yeah, I remember in 2015, I said that, you know, there was a couple of teams that had the ability to score 500 runs against some of the associate teams in Australia on the hard tracks and what we expect to be good, some good batting surfaces in, in Australia, also small grounds in New Zealand. Hmm. And, you know, that doesn't, that didn't really come about. And the more I think about it now, the more I think about, remember the, the game when England should have made 500 against the Netherlands? Hmm. Um, that's the kind of game that actually these teams should score 500. In World Cups, you usually see, you know, that little bit of more hesitancy, right, in the way that people yeah. play. Um, you know, South Africa is the gold-crusted <laughs> example of this. You know, we, we all know that there is an issue with the way that they play. But I think if you go through most World Cups, there's a lot of teams that do that. And it might be one reason why Australia is a little bit better at World Cups and that they continue to play in a similar method, whereas I think other teams think, well, this is the big one. Um, yeah. And it changes things. But yeah, it, there's no doubt. But so it, it does make this next World Cup fascinating, right? Of, of, how, of how that's going to go. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer. And so that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim? That I don't know deaths. I've been using deaths for years. I'm a collector of deaths, old and new, and I'm sitting on a new one right now. I'm the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit. This is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen and it has under desk cable management. But really the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore, even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional adjustable upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings. Yeah, and for those of you who want some context, go to the piece and see just how low the World Cups are compared to all of the other franchise T20 leagues. I mean, if the fastest scoring World Cup of all time is A, the first one, and that combined strike rate is 124, that's not a high strike rate at all. But Well, I mean, if you look at it, if the World Cup was hmm. a league, would we watch it? Because it's a, real, it's a really dour league. Like, you look at those scores and you think to yourself, poor... Oh, these are, this is like, you know, I, mean, I don't, have you watched much of the CPL? Because when you're in Canada, it would have been a good time zone. Did you watch much I, of it? I have. I especially watched a lot of it when uh, early days, you know, you got to see a lot of Pakistan players play in it. Yeah. Uh, so that really drew me towards the CPL. And I mean, I remember that season where the Talawas were great. One of the seasons where Barbados were great. But I haven't really religiously followed it, followed it every year. Every now and then I would. It can be crap to watch. Mm-hmm. It, the, it, the start of the no run. <laughs> one reason I didn't get into the early PSL was a, a similar one. And it's not that I want it to be specifically, you know, um, you know, uh, what, what would you call it? Uh, bowler, uh, sorry, batter friendly or, or bowler mm. friendly. But I'm, I've got no problem with lots of wickets, but I'm also going to want to want some runs as well. I want some life. Yeah. And, you know, you look at where the World Cup is on that map and you're like, that's, it doesn't look particularly good. And the CPL is the league it's probably most closely aligned to. Um, and I find the CPL a frustrating watch at times, um, you know, from, from game to game. Well, we did have a decent scoring year in the CPL last year, so maybe that's bound to change. But that brings me to probably one of the most important questions over here, that can we ins expect that record of combined strike rate of 124 set in 2007 in the T20 World Cup to be breached this year? I mean, you've got the slow surfaces in the Caribbean and the added you know, layer of pressure for international teams competing against each other. But then you mentioned that we might get some really batting-friendly surfaces in the USA with small ground dimensions. So 124 is not a tough record to usurp. 
No, no, no. I, I, I mean, we should be able to get past it, right? I think that's fair. We would both agree with that. Um, there, I think something changed in 2013, 2023. And I think you can see it through all these different leagues. And some of these leagues haven't played a second year yet. And, and, and I know there was some regression in some of these leagues as well. But I think it was around 2023 when there's been a bit of a jump up everywhere. And so with that in mind, I just think, I know Friesman Gokes a bad example because he's not going to be playing. But, you know, and Abhishek Sharma, I was going to use as well. He's not playing either. Head. But Travis you know what Head I mean? is your guy. <laughs> yeah, Travis Head, uh, you know, is a really good example. Heinrich mm -hmm. Klassen um, is another really good example um, you know, Sky Sky's, been, off. Yeah. Sky's been doing it for a little while, right? Mm -hmm. There's some, uh, Shivam Dubey, um, yeah. uh, you know, and the whole England batting lineup, right? Mm -hmm. Of, uh, you know, and, and, you know, Nicholas Puran and these sorts of guys, they've just reached another level, mm -hmm. I think of, of, uh, you know, that they can unlock now. And so with that, I would, I would find it very hard to believe, mm -hmm. um, that there's, that, you know, that there's not going to be a big, bigger year, um, uh, coming off the, off the back of that. But Having said that, you look at the data and it suggests to you, doesn't matter what happens, teams just yeah. don't score in World Cup. So I don't know. I mean, 125 at the very least, right? It has to be the fastest scoring one, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. But coming to the IPL now, because we've talked about all the other leagues and this is the big one that we really need to discuss. Now, it has always been a batting league, right? The last time the tournament had a bowling year was back in 2009, which was the third edition of the competition. So... When compared to the Big Bash League and the CPL, even the frugal IPL years have been more run heavy, <laughs> mm. uh, you know. Uh, and then in 2023, of course, you talk about that moment where everything changes. And that's another reason why that could have happened, particularly in the IPL, is because the impact sub rule comes in, right? That was introduced and we saw a significant uptick in scoring rate. And, you know, there are a bunch of reasons why batters bat the way they do right now. But specifically, when talking about the IPL, just because the impact sub provides such flexibility, and like you said, Ramandeep is coming out to bat in number nine. When you talk about this IPL and the previous one in isolation, how much of an impact does the impact sub uh, law or rule play on its own? There's other things, but just this, how significant is it? It's, it's interesting because the, what was the... Uh... Australian one called the X Factor. Surge, um, power surge and something They like had that. the two two different moves. Doesn't really seem to have impacted their league all that much, other yeah. than the fact that it ruined a lot of us when we were trying to keep data on things. <laughs> um, <coughs> so so I do think um, the impact sub has been a lot bigger than that. Hmm. I, I don't think it matters that you have Roman Deep batting at number nine or, you know, um, I think the, uh, Cheno might have had some really deep batting lineups last year as well. I don't think it matters as much from that point of view. And I think teams are using it more. Um, as in, if he's batting at nine, you're probably not going to use him that much anyway. But the Evan Golbus effect, which we've talked about before, is when you are batting, if you're opening the batting and you look up and, and number seven is Ashwin. Hmm. Think to yourself, okay, uh, I know he can hold a bat, but we're going to have to do a bit of work here. And, you know, I've been playing club cricket of recent times with some batting orders where the guys batting down the order can't bat. Right, and it changes the way that you go about your batting. It, it, it it's really hard not to, you know. Maybe for someone like Verinder Sehwag, you don't notice stuff like that. For every other normal human being, uh, you know, they are completely involved in that, and you know, and and get sucked in by that. So, with that, so so you add that, um, uh, you know, uh, the mental side of that to it. I think that's absolutely huge. And then once you start to bat like Travis Head or Abhishek Sharma or uh, who else we talk, Fraser McGurk and mm -hmm. Sunil Narine and Phil Salt, like all those sorts of guys, once they start to bat like that and they start hitting the ball out of the park regularly, it, it's, it really is what we have learned from T20 cricket's impact on ODI cricket, on mm -hmm. ODI cricket's impact on test cricket, right? These things feed off themselves. Suddenly a guy's like, oh, I can't go that hard and I can't yeah. get away with it, right? And, you know, the West Indies method of, of going, if it's a good ball, we block it. And if it's a bad ball, we hit it for six. If we can't hit it for six, we hit it for four. Is, is, a, is, a, is a method now that teams all around the world have, have managed to work out. And then individual matchups and who they're going to go up against and all these sorts of things. You know, things have changed, right? And, yeah. and, and, and so with all of that, I think what you are seeing is the, you know, this explosion of belief. Because mm. I think that's what me and Freddie always felt was it was they didn't like 
you know, they would do it once and they would fail and it wouldn't work or whatever. And now you're looking at it and you're just like, you're probably better off to play like Kolkata or Sunrisers. Hmm. If you've got a side set up to be able to do that, then you are to knock it around like another team and hope that your bowlers can dominate. Um, it, and with the impacts up, it's so hard to bowl teams out. Yeah, I mean, it's nearly impossible. Plus, you know, I think you're very right when you say that, you know, current uh, era batters and even batters who are experienced and now have evolved, they've kind of unlocked that different mode where they're just fearless and they're like, okay, we're going to throw the kitchen sink at it. Travis Head is a brilliant example of this. Travis Head's career T20 numbers don't mm. really hold up, but you look at him recently and you're like, yeah, that's probably one of the first names on Australia's team sheets. Like, he has to be opening the batting. And it's just the uh, punchy nature of his batting, you know, pitch it up, you know, uh, bang it in short, whatever you do, he's going to hit you. So that's something that is a recent development is in his career. And of course, we mentioned earlier as well that if you put all of these major leagues from all of those years with their combined strike rates and averages, you know, and then you put in the World Cups, the gulf is, you know, insane because the World yeah. Cups are kind of like uh, sweeping the floor over there <laughs> in comparison to all of those leagues. And And we've also mentioned how it's a different beast altogether. But when you remove all the other ones, just throw in the IPL tournaments and the World Cups, that gulf becomes even more massive. There's like daylight between those two. And you look at the ongoing IPL and you see that it's reached this other level altogether. Like mm. it's an anomaly on its own, on that scatter graph. It's like that one dot all the way to the towards the right, right? So, I mean, of course, the impact sub is there. But as you mentioned, batters are braver. They've unlocked that mode. The game has evolved. You've got you know, uh, intricate details in T20 cricket, which define broader game plans, such as matchups and entry points and all of that fun stuff. Do you see any of the belligerence that we are experiencing in the IPL spill into the T20 World Cup a month later? Yeah, I do. I do think it will have an impact. Um, whether it works or not, <laughs> I don't know. But but I do think that will be an impact of... Um, Anyone who's watched this tournament will realize there is a new ceiling. So, yeah. so I talk about a little bit of, is this IPL season like the 400-400 game, hmm. B right? Between, between the two teams, uh, between Australia and South Africa. Mm -hmm. That was it. That happened. And it let us know that where we could get to, but we didn't get anywhere near that for ages, right? We yeah. didn't have a, a slew of games. You know, this whole thing, do you remember that point? Was it 2019? Everyone's like, 300 is a new par. Is it? <laughs> no one's scored 300. Where are all these 300 scores? You're all promising us, right? Yeah. So, so I think straight away, you, you look at something like that and you do think to yourself, okay, so th something has changed here. And there is, uh, you know, a difference in the game um, as it is played at the moment compared to, um, you know, the way that it could be played, right? So, so I think instantly you, you understand that people I, I've got that. But there's a big difference between that and then actually believing that that can happen, <laughs> right? Do you know what I mean? So this yeah. is, to go back to the 400 game, so Australia, South Africa in 2006, seven, was it? Whenever I want to say was. six. Yeah, that game yeah. In, 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 that we were talking about before. That you talked about is, and they understood that they were in a position where that sort of stuff was going to happen more often, right? And that they could get there. But the next games weren't like that. But they did think differently. Hmm. Is this a season that is actually just part of a natural curve up, which hmm. it could be? Or is this a season where everything has just gone right for the batters? And we're already seeing tougher conditions, right? Yeah. So the, what the, I did this video on around, I, I, mean, I think the data is from the 1st of May. Yes. And we've already seen a bunch of lower scoring games since hmm. then. And we saw a couple coming into the 1st of May as well, right? Yep. Is it just a conditions-based thing? And you look at this map, and I would say to you that T20 cricket is a conditions-based sport more than we probably ever give it credit for. But when you look at this and you see all the patterns and everything else, it's like it's all well and good to say the mindset has changed. And look at this IPL. Everyone's going to score a million runs. It's like, are they? Let's. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll reserve that for the next time I see a CPL game in Guyana, yeah. right? Mm. Uh, I'll believe that when there's a big bash year when they all score over a strike rate of 145, right? Mm -hmm. And if that starts to happen, I'm on board, Barham, right? Yeah. That that means the train has come. My mm -hmm. guess is we will see a couple more outlier seasons like this, but I don't think everywhere can do this. 
And I do think that the, that means that the IPL is an individual uh, mm. part of it. And if you, you know, you look at the, the data of the IPL, we talked about the two, well, the, the two, two and a half batting leagues, mm. Pakistan and Pakistan, uh, the Blast <laughs> and the IPL. The IPL is still the dominant batting league of those three leagues, right? Yes. And if you go through the history of ODI cricket and test cricket, what do we know about India? It's a great place to bat, mm -hmm. right? We never say, that's not something we say about West Indies ever. Yeah. Right? No one ever says West Indies is a great place to bat. Occasionally you get flat pitches, but you don't say it's a mm. great place to bat, right? Mm. And SA20, when I have two or three years of data or that, I'd be really fascinated to see where that one comes up. Because that's also, looks like to me, people are making runs, but I want to see a couple more years. And I wanted to, I did, IL, uh, the IL and the, and, and the SA20, I just wanted to see them mm. a little bit more cricket before I made any decisions there. But yeah. it does look like more often than not, the conditions still dictate. And, mm. you know, and, and England is a place that for white ball cricket went all in on runs at very early um, point, probably around 2008, 2009. So you can change that. You can change what your pitches are, but you probably need money. You probably need the support of everyone involved. Um, and then you go about it from that perspective. But it's, it's fascinating anyway of how much these wickets still drive the game, despite the <laughs> fact that we probably don't always think about it that way in T20 cricket. I think it's just not said enough, you know, that conditions do dictate uh, the play uh, to a large extent. And sometimes you'll be like, oh, why is this team not close to 60 in the power play? Well, yeah. maybe they can't get there on that particular surface, right? Uh, even though I would argue that even on slow surfaces, people should really go for it in the power play when the ball is hard. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think another thing why the IPL sees such heavy run scoring is because India on its own, yes, it's a great place to bat, but it also produces great batters. So yeah. that also kind of you know, yeah. feeds into that uh, narrative. And you do see that. India and Australia, I think, probably have the, you know, the two best um, mm. batting crops since World War II. Mm. Um, and they are probably the two places that it is the best to bat. Um, mm. You know, there's challenges in both of those places. Um, and it, But I almost think the challenges are more for the overseas players than they are for the local players. Um, and so you do see great batting come out of those places in, in a way that we don't always see with other countries. So... Yeah, I, th I think that's a that's another great way of looking at it, right? Of of, yeah. of how of how those things go, um, and you know, small grounds helps as well. Yeah, uh, lightning absolutely. fast outfields. You know, there's a few things that India has. That, do <laughs> do all yeah, actually, do you know what? I, I wonder if India is one of the dewiest places um, when it comes to cricket. Um, although having said that, you would have thought the UAE would have been quite dewy, um, uh, and yet doesn't seem to really. Um, it doesn't seem to really come across that way, does it? When you when uh, when you look at these data, so it's, it's, um, it's called the UAE, Jared, not the UAE. Hey. <laughs> but yeah, India and even Pakistan, it, at least at this time of the year, April, May, you get a lot of dew. But ultimately, of course, the IPL is also a different beast, and it's completely unfair to compare that tournament to World Cup cricket because, again, as I mentioned before and we both agreed, that, you know, in World Cups, players are playing for their nations. They are under more pressure to perform and win games. And the impact sub rule won't exist in the Caribbean, the USA in a month's time. And yeah. the pitches aren't going to be as flat, at least in the Caribbean, as they are in India currently. But, you know, there is a chance that this T20 World Cup, as we've both agreed upon, will probably be the highest scoring one or, or will have the highest combined strike rate of any T20 World Cup ever before. Mm. And, you know, you mentioned the 400 game, the, in, the game in which it was chased by South Africa at the Wanderers. And that was, in a way, an inflection point in the sport, but we saw the results come in later. We could be in the midst of an inflection point right yep. now. You know, just look at the Sunrisers bat. They're actually batting right now. I don't know how well they're doing, but you look at them bat and that screams inflection point. Yes. Uh, and, and it's not just them, is it? You know, KKR, Mumbai, mm. Delhi. So there's four teams in the IPL. Am I missing any? Kolkata. Mumbai, yeah, Kolkata, yeah. Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Sunrisers. I think you got all of them, yeah. Yeah, so is that four or five That's that we think? Four, uh, because Gujarat's not in this. <laughs> yeah. It's as further away as it can be. From this yeah, and even some of those other teams that aren't as full Put on. Punjab. As, as, Put Punjab in there, yeah. they chase down well, to 60. Yeah, so, you know, you look at that and you go, that to me, at least mm -hmm. IPL specific, suggests something else. But those things will catch on from other places. Mm -hmm. But if you go back and you play in the BPL, right, and, you know, and you get a couple of stickier wickets, or if you, you know, you play at the Gabba and, and it seems around a little bit or whatever, you can be as intense in this, this 
as you want. You can have all the intent in the world. You're still not going to be able to do all that much with it, right? Like, yeah. you, you know, so I, that's the truth side of that. But we have seen now, we, we have had three revolutions in all three formats of cricket with scoring rates in the last, what, six, seven years? Uh, no, I mean, yeah, from could, 2015 could... onwards. Count how Australia played uh, both the limited overs in Test cricket back in the early 2000s as well. Yeah, I mean Australia had it. So that, but that was mm -hmm. what was that to 98, and then 2015 England is the next yes. sort of big bang that we see. Uh, then we see baseball, um, mm -hmm. and now we're seeing this current T20 um, yeah. storm happening. So that means from 2015 to now, so the last nine years, we've had mm -hmm. three, all three formats have had a boom. It's yeah. not an accident, right? Batters are understanding what they can do. And, bo you know, bowlers can bowl the greatest delivery of all time, that, you know, and, and they're finding better ways of being defensive bowlers. I actually still think the bowlers are doing quite well, despite all, all the talk. Um, and and uh, I mean, the opposite. Uh, new shots are coming in and becoming mainstream, like the class and shot and how Fraser McGurk was doing something similar versus yep. uh, spinners when they bowl at a good length, right? Which wasn't happening before. So you're seeing yeah. the evolution happen firsthand right in front of our faces? I, I think I did a piece about six or seven years ago for Crick Info where there was only like six major T20 players who scored quicker against spin than pace. And I remember Cameron Akmal was massively faster mm -hmm. against spin than pace. And I think Chris Gale might have been one of the others. Everyone else was, ma was way quicker against pace than spin. Mm -hmm. You're now watching, you know, some of these new players come through and you're like, they're going to be able to score at almost two runs a ball against spin. Yeah. And so that is a huge change in the way that we think about the game. And, you know, and because of that, uh, you know, there's, there's no, there, there's no, there's no way around it. Right. Like mm. it is, it is what it is, which is um, we are in a situation where players have unlocked something um, and, and if I think spin was the thing probably keeping the rates down hmm. and the middle overs and people knocking the ball around. If people aren't going to do that anymore, there should be, a, you know, we should see more and more rises. Yeah. And I mean, whilst uh, this upcoming T20 World Cup might not be, you know, an anomaly in terms of scoring rates and might, might not be the most, you know, uh, it, it, it might not match up to anything that we're seeing in the franchise leagues across the world. But currently what we're seeing, experiencing is that it's on the horizon. It's it's on the cusp. It will happen eventually where teams will start to score quickly. And, you know, let's see how quickly that happens. But before we call it quits on this podcast, just want to take a quick prediction from you. Tell me what you think the combined strike rate for this T20 World Cup will be. We'll both give a number and then we'll see who wins. I'm going to go 131. Hmm. I'm going to go 128. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, more games are in the Caribbean and, you know, all of these teams are selecting tons of spinners in their teams as well, if, if, in the squads, if, if you've noticed. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. No, maybe. no, no, I mean, also, <laughs> the only other thing I would say that's in your favour is that yeah. players like Abhishek Sharma um, and um, Fraser McGurk are not being picked. Yep. Right? So teams are still just holding firm on the old mm. guys a little bit longer, the more conservative batters. Mm. Um, so, I... That makes me a little bit nervous. I just think that the last World Cup was a real anomaly just mm -hmm. because of the weather conditions in Australia and it being out of yeah. season. Um, and, I, and I think that there'll be a natural... I don't think that... It, I could be wrong, but I just don't believe the ICC are going to allow for another bowler-dominated tournament. They're going to need mm -hmm. some runs, but um, it, it's not going to be a run fest. I don't, I, I'd be, if it was a run fest and it was over 135, I would be absolutely shocked. Yeah, I think we're going to get a vast variety of different surfaces and the I, I, ICC always kind of, you know, has that balance in their tournaments and then every now and then they'll throw in a slow surface <laughs> in the knockouts. <laughs> that always happens as well. Uh, but anyway, you guys let us know what you think think the combined strike rate of this upcoming T20 World Cup would be. Jair said 131, I said 128. Uh, and yeah, go and tell us what you think it will be in the comments. The highest ever combined strike rate for any T20 World Cup is 124 in 2007. But that brings us uh, towards a conclusion in this podcast. And as mentioned earlier, for all of our written work, videos and podcasts, you can go to goodareas.co. That can be a one-stop shop for all of the work that our team 
carries out. And uh, yeah, that's an end uh, for this Footmarks episode. We'll be back with another episode next week. Till then, you guys have fun. Goodbye.